Hello everyone, my name is Elle and welcome to my channel. I discuss makeup of the past and the future. I've been asked time and time again, how did hard candy go from high end to Walmart? Well, let's get into hard candy's story. Hard candy began as a nail polish brand, breaking through after the monumental success of Chanel's Vamp, which changed the polish industry forever. According to the Hard Candy website, their About Us states, Hard Candy, a vision for beauty that's all about freedom, fluidity, and unfiltered expression. Our color-daring, skin-caring collections offer high-tech beauty breakthroughs, pro artistry, and color trends, all for under $10. Hard Candy is 100% cruelty-free, so you can test out the trends without worrying about animal testing. Vague about us or brand histories on official websites always make me pause. Well, hard candy has changed quite significantly over the years, but it all began in the mid-1990s with a pair of sandals and a pre-med student. Dina Mohajer, an Iranian-American, born in 1972, was on a journey to become a doctor following in her father's footsteps. Dina and her boyfriend, Benjamin Einstein, attended Boston University for one year. Benjamin decided to transfer to the University of Southern California, and logically, Dina followed him there. Dina, being a lover of fashion and makeup, loved California, but quickly found herself bored with pre-med life. Always studying, always working, there was little time to have fun. One day, Dina decided she wanted a baby blue polish to match her sandals, and she searched everywhere for such a color. When she couldn't find one, she decided to make it herself taking a bottle of white Essie polish and some cheap pigment from a beauty supply store. Wherever she went, friends and strangers both complimented the polish, asking her where she got it and where they could get it to. She started mixing the polish for her friends. Before long, her sister, Puna, a lawyer, suggested that she start a business. Maybe this could be something. At the beginning, the brand was nameless and was being passed out in the SE bottles they were mixed in with help from Dina's boyfriend, Ben. And just to note, at the time, Dina did not admit to using SE, rather saying that a chemist friend helped her create polish. But to set them apart, Dina placed a little plastic ring around the top of the bottle in a matching color. At the very beginning of Hard Candy, when I was making the nail liqueur in my college apartment, I used SE bottles, which at the time had no customized elements. I would dump out half of Essie's pure white polish and add an electric blue, almost fluorescent shade of some random nail liqueur cheapy brand and shake, shake, shake it until my arm was tired. When friends would come over to my house, they would choke from the fumes and I would look at them like they were crazy because I was so used to it. I didn't smell anything. About three months in, I found a glass supplier that supplied me with what became the final polish packaging. What was great was that the gummy rings fit perfectly on top of both the Essie and our final glass bottle. The gummy rings came from a party supply store. It dawned on me that the rings fluorescent shades matched the fluorescent base color of the nail polish mixtures, and the next thing I knew, I was sliding the rings over the top. It was random, it worked, and then it just exploded. It was a stroke of luck, timing, silliness, and inspiration. And in May 1995, they had settled on the name Hard Candy, and according to the trademark history, it was first used a month later in June. The line started with four shades of polish, sky, pale blue, sunshine yellow, mint green, and violet. Dina worked for Fred Siegel in some capacity. Some sources say she started working there part-time in 1992. Some say that it was a summer gig and she would cover shifts for friends. But Fred Siegel is the first place to sell hard candy polish. And there are multiple variations of how this came to be. One version of the story goes that Dina and or her boyfriend at the time, Ben, made a sales pitch to Fred Siegel. They were turned down. But if right on cue, a teenager who was shopping with her mom saw the polishes and wanted them and bought the prototypes on the spot, causing Fred Siegel to place an order for 200 polishes. The second story is that Dina wore the polish on her nails to work. The daughter of Fred Siegel, Sharon Siegel, happened to be in the store, saw the polish, and asked where Dina got it. When Dina said it was her own brand, Sharon suggested it could be sold in their store. With an order from Fred Siegel, Dina, Ben, and Puna got to work. With the enlistment of some friends, they mixed all the polishes in Dina's home. Day and night, they would work on mixing these polishes, slowly adding in more shades like bubblegum, peachy, and coconut white. 
The big break for Hard Candy was when, by some stroke of luck, Alicia Silverstone got her hands on Hard Candy Polish. On July 17, 1995, Alicia made an appearance on The Late Show with David Letterman. And when asked by Letterman what was on her nails, she responded, Sky from Hard Candy. This was when Alicia was promoting a little movie known as Clueless, which came out two days following the Letterman interview. That film made Alicia the it girl of 1995. Vogue wrote about the polish, Elle, Harper's Bazaar, and Teen Magazine all did too, just to name a few. Everybody wanted the it girl's favorite polish. At this time, all of the publications published Dina's phone number for potential customers to call and order bottles of the must-have polish. I made these polishes and sent them to a bunch of beauty editors at magazines thinking, maybe someone will write about them. I didn't strategize in terms of PR. And then they actually did all write about it, and all the press came out around the same time. The phone number to my house was listed in the credits. Dina kept having to add phone lines to her apartment. This was 1995, after all. Promoting products via the internet was not a thing. So there really were no alternatives. But as Sylvia Sansoni noted in Forbes, Dina had never seen a balance sheet or a financial statement, and she kept no record of inventory, orders, sales, or invoices. Predictably, she began to lose control of distribution. Hard candy polish started popping up on the not-too-exclusive shelves of drugstores and tattoo shops. Making the polish was a groovy pastime, but having to deal with the nuts and bolts of running a real company was not for her. With some encouragement from her sister, her family invested an estimated $50,000 into the company. Hard candy had exploded into a legitimate business. They needed a fulfillment center, they needed production, they needed help. Nobody involved with Hard Candy at the beginning knew anything about working in the cosmetic industry. It was luck and timing. Dina said at the time, I didn't make that first batch of blue nail polish so I could stand up to men or be outrageous, or so I could make some sort of stand for women. But what it's really about is self-esteem. Women being able to do whatever they want and look stylish and attractive and cute at the same time. Do women do that for men? Sure they do. But do they do it for themselves? Sure they do. Scott Vincent Borba, credited co-founder of ELF, is sometimes also credited as launching hard candy. But to quote him, I got my big break while working as a Ford model and a commercial real estate agent at CB Commercial Real Estate. My beauty industry career began at hard candy when I helped the owners find their office space. And there is no proof of Scott Vincent working with hard candy in any other capacity. Dina did find a local bottler around this time who agreed to help out with the production of hard candy polishes and everything seemed okay until the bottler fell behind schedule. Dina was waiting for hard candy shipments while a mysterious new knockoff brand called Crazy Candy hit the shelves. She called in her lawyers and succeeded in halting Crazy Candy's production. I trust no one completely now. Everyone has his own agenda. It's a lesson that comes from getting burned. Urban Decay also hit the market around this time in 1996, launching with their own unusual polishes. Revlon attempted to purchase Hard Candy, but Dina declined their offer and they launched their own streetwear line, which Urban Decay took Revlon to court over. Competition was brewing over alternative cosmetics. Dina hired a 60-something former nuclear engineer, William Botts, as CEO. William hired multiple suppliers of dyes, bottles, and caps to get prices down and speed up deliveries. He set up a network of sales representatives and cut off the low-end retailers. He pieced together the company's financial history and computerized the accounting system. And the positive press continued. Fashion magazines and beauty editors couldn't get enough of these fun polishes, and more celebrities were seen wearing the shades. Drew Barrymore, Pamela Anderson, Sarah Michelle Gellar, Courtney Love, Lisa Marie Presley, and supermodels like Naomi Campbell. Designers like Anna Sui were even using the polish on models for runway shows. In addition to the colors, the names were also gaining attention. I wanted the names to reflect the colors, but in a cool way, in a way that hadn't been done before. Ben, Dina's then-boyfriend, said, It's just nail polish, but it's called porno or chronic, and that adds flavor. Porno, a brown shade. Jailbait, ivory, pimp, purple. New shades were being created constantly to be added to the hard candy lineup. Scam, lime. Frigid, pastel icy blue. Greed, green. Trailer park trash, shiny silver, and pussycat pink. They even had an invincible top coat, allegedly made from space-age polymers that they spray it on buildings to protect them from corrosion. 
Hard Candy also gained a lot of press from the Candyman nail polish line aimed at men. Dog, Purple, Testosterone, Steel Gun, Cowboy, Gold, Oedipus, Forest Green, Gigolo, Black, Superman, Metallic Blue, and Libido, a teal made for San Jose Sharks fans. Seven masculine colors. The inspiration came from men who were enjoying to express themselves with nail polish. Well-known fans of hard candy polish included Lenny Kravitz, Quentin Tarantino, Dennis Rodman, Antonio Banderas, Sean Lennon, and members of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Smashing Pumpkins, and Garbage, to name a few. By 1997, they had 60 shades of polish in their regular line and seven for men, as well as lipsticks to match the polish's unusual hues. 800 stores later, including places like Nordstrom, Saks Fifth Avenue, Neiman Marcus, and Sephora, and with the expansion of the line into color cosmetics, including fun products like glitter eyeliner, Hard Candy generated approximately 10 million in sales in 1999. And in 1999, LVMH acquired Hard Candy. They held 94% while Dina remained a minority shareholder with 6% and was also on contract as creative director. Basically, the business just became too much for me to handle, Dina said. Dina lasted less than a year as creative director of Hard Candy under LVMH. Rumors were that she didn't function well in a corporate environment and soon ran off to spend the fortune she accumulated from the sale of the brand. I was pretty young to have a bank account like that. That was fancy for me, she would admit later and so LVMH took over complete ownership of the brand. But just three years after the initial acquisition, thanks to multiple imitators and a tough market, Hard Candy's spotlight began to fade, and the brand again changed hands, this time to Phallic Fashion Group, a subsidiary of Duty Free Americas of Hollywood, Florida. In fact, LVMH unloaded Urban Decay and Hard Candy for a combined one million, according to LVMH financial reports. LVMH had acquired Hard Candy's number one competitor, Urban Decay, in 2000, one year after they had acquired Hard Candy. But LVMH failed to understand how to operate the two brands that differed so greatly from the majority of what was in their portfolio, and so both struggled. Although LVMH did try, appointing industry veteran Adele Hamden as managing director of both brands. At the time, Adele said, I believe Hard Candy has a very strong personality and stands for something in the eyes of consumers. I want to move Hard Candy's identity back to the fun, innovative brand it can be. I'd also like to expand distribution and possibly to have standalone shops. As well, to improve efficiencies, we are integrating our backroom functions with those of our parent LVMH, which will allow us to focus on marketing, creation, and the sales aspect. Phallic now had the difficult task of dealing with these competitive brands. While inherently different, Hard Candy and Urban Decay shared a consumer base. In spring of 2003, Wendy Zomner was named creative director of Hard Candy in addition to being the creative director of Urban Decay. The positioning, Urban Decay as an edgy, sophisticated brand with a dangerous side, with Hard Candy as a more accessible, slightly lower priced fun line. To me, Urban Decay has always been about beauty with an edge. Everything has to be dangerous, feminine, and fun. It's not for everyone. Hard Candy has more of a broad appeal. Saying further that my philosophy is that the Hard Candy customer has a distinct price threshold. For instance, one of the Quad's four color compacts retails for $35 right now, and after the repricing, it will be $25. We'll also be doing some stocking stuffer holiday items for the first time. However, we're still looking at prestige prices and frankly, some of our items are priced perfectly right now and will stay the same. We'll still maintain our quality standards. In honor of the brand's 10th anniversary in 2005, Wendy reintroduced Sky Nail Polish, the iconic baby blue shade, in addition to five other colors, Frigid, a sheer light blue, Jailbait, a lavender shade, Pussycat, a sparkling pink, Tantrum, a shimmery lime, and Trailer Trash, a gunmetal silver, as well as a return to more of the original packaging. It's an iconic item that made such an impact on the whole industry, Wendy said, of the decision to return to the original packaging. Over the years, the bottle had morphed into a slimmer, more rectangular shape. When we started pulling out vintage product to get inspiration, everyone kept saying how much they loved it. However, nail polish formulas and colors were updated from more opaque pastels to sheer iridescent colors in line with the trends of the time. 
Of course, Wendy's changes to the brand did not always keep with Hard Candy's origins, such as the complete packaging overhaul, price point slashing, and the discontinuation of more than 80% of Hard Candy's original stock keeping units. We felt like the retail pricing was too high for Hard Candy's customer. The more playful side was being played up with items such as the lollipop lip gloss, a $6 item that had a lollipop shape and candy inspired plastic wrapping. We try to have a fun grab and go item that's priced under $10, Wendy said. Other items included a double ended brow eyebrow pencil and gel at $10 and a $12 candy coating lip gloss which featured pen like packaging. But this wasn't the only big news for hard candy this year. I have speculated in the past that Urban Decay owned hard candy, but was always shot down. My first suspicion was when I noticed trademark history. Urban Decay still has canceled hard candy trademarks showing up when I searched them. And dig a little deeper, and the history of hard candy trademarks show that Urban Decay was once the owner. How could a company own trademarks for a brand if they weren't in some way affiliated with them? Many people would say that was because they were owned by the same company. True, both were owned at this time by the Phallic Group, but that still didn't explain the trademark history. So I went further, and I found documents that mentioned Hard Candy and Urban Decay had merged. And then I found the actual certificate of the merger, and all of the proof that existing Hard Candy trademarks were transferred to Urban Decay's ownership at this time in 2005. Hard Candy LLC would no longer exist. Instead, the brand would be Urban Decay, and Urban Decay referred to Hard Candy in some legal documents as their house brand, while sometimes referred to casually as sister brands. If you check the Wayback Machine, both sites had links to each other's pages. In 2007, for example, Urban Decay had a link to Hard Candy, and Hard Candy had Urban Decay, as well as the note of Urban Decay DBA doing business as hard candy in the bottom. Urban Decay's sales climbed and hard candy's sales declined. Hard candy's distribution shrank to several hundred select prestige outlets as well as to duty-free shops with estimated retail sales between seven and ten million dollars according to Phallic. In 2008 slowly people started to notice that pieces of hard candy's line were disappearing. Suddenly the brand was on sale everywhere, 50-75% off. We're repositioning some parts of the brand, said Jerome Fallick, chief executive officer of Fallick Fashion Group. We're taking the opportunity to clear the color merchandise and at the same time work on some new things, said Tim Warner, who at the time was president of Hard Candy as well as the Urban Decay brand. Adding that it was too early to discuss specifics of future color initiatives, he said, we plan to bring back color. The website was taken down and under construction. The Fallot Group was attempting to form a partnership with a company for the licensing of the Hard Candy name. This came with New World Beauty. This company partnered previously with Walmart to bring the Mary Kate and Ashley cosmetic brand. And Hard Candy disappeared from the shelves for less than a year. The original Hard Candy Company, based out of California, had been cancelled, so the Phallic Group created a new Hard Candy LLC, based out of their home state of Florida this time, and Urban Decay transferred the Hard Candy trademarks to this new Hard Candy. So this was Hard Candy in name only. The Hard Candy that launched in Walmart in the late 2000s truly was a brand new version of the brand. The Walmart launch was met with mixed emotions. Some people were happy to see a cheaper alternative, some were dismayed that previously loved products would no longer exist or no longer be the same. The overall approach was to take this formerly prestige brand, which was fun, avant-garde, and edgy, and create it in the same way as if they were going into a prestige outlet. The new line consisted of 261 items ranging from shimmer lip glosses, baked eyeshadow duos, glitter liquid eyeliner, volume mascara, and eyeliner pencils that double as hair sticks. Prices averaged $7. Carmen Bauza, vice president of beauty for Walmart, said at the time it seemed as if she had given birth to the new line, seeing that she and Walmart's entire beauty team had created and executed its entire development. The customer will feel like she's in a candy store, Carmen said of the new items, which fill a gap in the marketplace, mainly with 18 to 35, 40 year old women, as well as the young at heart. They're very familiar with the brand. I know hard candy very well and felt it was the right choice based on our knowledge of the customer. 
Urban Decay, meanwhile, was sold from the phallic group to Castanea Partners at the same time Hard Candy launched in Walmart. New World Beauty has since been purchased by Cosmax, a similar production company, but the phallic group still owns Hard Candy as of this video and continues licensing out the use of the trademarks for exclusive use at Walmart. Hard Candy's website redirects customers to purchase from Walmart and they no longer sell directly from their own website. What do you think about Hard Candy then and Hard Candy now? I'd love to hear your thoughts. And I'd love to hear any stories you have about using Hard Candy products. Thank you so, so much for watching. Let me know what other videos you'd like to see. I hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are and I hope we get a chance to chat soon. Bye for now.